crispy, crunchy, and nutritious. You you got it right. It is the Sixers Talk Podcast with you once again here in the new year 2022. So glad you could join us. Noah Levick, our esteemed NBC Sports Philadelphia.com Sixers writer. Happy New Year to you, bro. How you feeling? Happy to New Year to you as well. Uh, I'm feeling okay. Yeah, it felt like the new year began like 2021 when we got this storm of pregame Sixers news last night uh, before they played the Rockets. So that was almost comforting. Deja vu like, right? Yeah, the, the familiarity of just, you know, the calendar can change, but uh, the Sixers are the Sixers and they're a team that uh, tends to like a little bit of drama. So uh, we're, we're back in business. Hey, man, it's like either you're getting like the full on drama, a little diet drama, but there is the drama that's always there. But, you know, they could be like the Eagles who have like a dozen dudes on the COVID list after beating Washington. So I guess glass half full, Noah. But um, we will get into uh, some of that drama um, with a bit later with Tobias Harris. And it's kind of like a little macro micro situation. I think with this team right now, macro, they're climbing up the standings. The wins are stringing together. Joel Embiid is playing uh, virtuoso, as I like to say. Um, and we'll get into Tobias and his back and forth with the fans in a bit. But let's stay with the macro right now, Noah. And uh, yeah, um, the Sixers were without suddenly uh, Tyrese Maxey was in the protocol joining Matisse Stiebel, who was already in the health and safety protocol uh, pregame. And on the flip side, the Rockets were down two of their best guys with Kevin Porter Jr. and Christian Wood both suspended because of an altercation uh, with uh, John Lucas, where neither of them played after the halftime in their last game because of a spat. So uh, both teams a little less than full strength, but the Sixers end up getting the 20 point victory, albeit once again, uh, a slow start and a tight game at halftime um, where I guess Keith Pompey's question, if we want to bring that back up, uh, kind of continues to have some merit with the Sixers continuing to play down to lesser teams, a 10 win Rockets team, one of the worst in the Western Conference for sure. Um, but with all that said, Joel Embiid shines his brightest uh, at home in moments like this. And the team still under 500 at home. Also worth noting as they uh, start to climb closer toward that. Um, just give us your impressions of the awesomeness that Joel Embiid showed us on the court last night. Well, I think it just continues to look very easy for him. There was one play in the, in the first quarter where he missed a few point back, uh, point blank shots, but a little Moses I, Malone action. He kind of went back and he, got it. <laughs> yeah. Patted, patted the rebounding stats a little, but, right. uh, against a familiar foe in Daniel Tice, uh, you know, who opposed him be quite a few times with the Celtics, uh, everything looked comfortable and he established deep post position quite often and handled double teams. Well, although he wasn't pleased with his six turnovers at the end of the night, but, uh, triple double number three of Embiid's career, and the transition playmaking was again a feature of his game. Had one very nice Euro step uh, into a thunderous dunk, and uh, he also is just so smooth these days as a facilitator in transition too. Which, though he did not name Ben Simmons, he admitted the Sixers don't have their point guard, and therefore the circumstances do merit MD doing a little bit more uh, when it comes to just grabbing a rebound and heading up the floor and uh, making something happen with the basketball. So uh, he was great. He's been great against most teams, um, you know, during this recent stretch, just wrapped up a month of December when he averaged, I believe, 29.6 points uh, on 49.6, like 39.1, 84-ish shooting splits. And that included the first game of the month when he shot uh, three for 17 against Boston. So playing at a high level, uh, you'd expect the Sixers to dispatch the Rockets as they ultimately did, winning this one by 20, uh, regardless of you know whether Embiid is at that elite level. But um, yeah, continuing to play very, very good basketball in the new year. I think we'd be remiss uh, not to mention, you mentioned his December, 
and the way he started it and his numbers from that month, the way he ended it uh, since our last podcast with the miraculous, um, well, no, I guess not miraculous, but fantastic game against uh, the Brooklyn Nets and going, you know, nose to nose with Kevin Durant and the competitiveness that those two put on display and the waving goodbye to Brooklyn and, and the whole bit that carried right on over into this Rockets game where the Sixers haven't been, you know, fantastic at home for whatever reasons in this weird, you know, COVID pandemic induced season. Um, they haven't had the uh, stellar home record that they've enjoyed the past few seasons, but 20 wins here for the Philadelphia 76ers, not far from that upper echelon of the Eastern Conference uh, as the Brooklyn Nets and um, the Chicago Bulls are sitting there and one, two. Um, uh, you know, you look at Joel Embiid and his performance and, you know, wh what he's been doing in the month of December. Here he is carrying it over in January. You got to, you know, no, Nikola Jokic is having an incredible season, but you got to give Joel Embiid some MVP consideration at this point, um, whether it's Steph and KD or whoever's in that conversation. Joel has been really putting up great numbers and performing with his team winning games as well. Probably has some catching up to do, but if he plays like he did in December for the rest of the season, yeah, you'd figure he'd be in that picture, especially since I'm sure folks around the league will recognize and appreciate the circumstances in Philadelphia where Ben Simmons is under contract but not playing basketball, uh, and Joel Embiid has needed to step up on both ends of the floor. As we saw last night, the Sixers' perimeter defense frankly, for much of this season has been substandard and Joel Embiid has had more cleaning up to do than usual. And in addition, and in addition to that, his versatility just continues to, I think, grow and grow on both ends of the floor. It's quite switchable for a seven foot player. His, his handle improves every year. His passing improves every year. It feels like I think MVP consideration to me doesn't feel especially probable, but uh, he's one of the few best players in the sport right now. There's no doubt. Uh, George Niang uh, a few days ago said he's a top five, top three player right now. And even more than that, um, he admires that Embiid is, is dedicated to being a leader of this basketball team and trying to, get the most out of the other four players on the court as well. And that's something a lot of the Sixers have commented on that um, his leadership um, is a very noticeable component of his, of his game. In addition to all of the impressive on court production. I'm also impressed, you know, it's, it's one thing, you know, we kind of missed out on a few of those matchups earlier in the season because of Embiid having COVID with him and Rudy Gobert and him against Denver and Nikola Jokic. But He's going nose to nose with perimeter players and Kevin Durant, like, and you know, okay, yeah, uh, it's one thing to be, you know, dominating the the front court, or excuse me, the um underneath the basket, but you know, and the front court, but you know, you you're going against backcourt players and you know, uh, showing off, you know, your handle and you know, bringing the ball up the court and things like that, continuing to fester that unicorn ideal that he is just, you know, a once in a lifetime type of player. Yeah, um, we, we would like to see, you know, more consistency in, in some ways where he, you know, sometimes allows guys to get to the rim in certain situations where I think he can contest or what have you. And maybe he's worried about, you know, getting the ball out the rim and going the other way. But, you know, we just continue to see him do things that we haven't seen. And, you know, the leadership and all of that stuff just continues to want you to get him in a situation where he can get more help. and. The help he got last night was from an unlikely source in Furkan Korkmaz, who for a good stretch of the game, deep into the third quarter, he and MB were the only double-digit scorers um, on the floor for the 76ers um, with Tobias and Seth both struggling. Um, what did you make of Furkan Korkmaz stepping up to be, you know, Embiid's number two, uh, particularly coming out shooting really hot in that first quarter? I think he had three threes. Definitely, yeah. Just one one final little nugget on on Embiid that I that I thought was telling uh, from Dan Burke, the acting Sixers head coach with Doc Rivers and COVID protocols. Torino so far. 
uh, I believe two two and zero, but yeah, undefeated. Uh, I think he and and the Brooklyn one, obviously a, a high quality one. Uh, but Dan Burke, who was a long time uh, defensive assistant with the Indiana Pacers, was quite honest in saying, like when he was with Indiana, the idea was like wear him be down, get him into the fourth quarter, and he probably wouldn't be that much of a problem down the stretch because of his his conditioning was problematic. And he said since he's joined the team, he, he's just noticed the strides and be has made in that area. So that was a little light bulb B for me, just because sometimes when you're around this every day, you feel like you're exaggerating or overstating these storylines of Embiid's in better shape than ever. Embiid's working on the leadership more than ever. And no, like you zoom out a little bit and you look at the perspective of this veteran assistant coach who had to try to scheme against Embiid and uh, all this stuff is meaningful that he has like dedicated a lot of time to improving the health and fitness and that he is trying to be more vocal and um, take on more of the leadership. So I, I just thought that was a, a good nugget from Dan Burke. Um, yeah, and, great point. Yeah, Dan Burke, uh, he gave Furkan Korkmaz some ball handling responsibilities uh, with, you know, um, Tyrese Maxey uh, not available. And Furkan Korkmaz loved that. He talked after the game about how he feels comfortable with the ball in his hands and he personally prefers it and, and likes the confidence uh, that that gives him as opposed to situations where maybe he's lingering off the ball and doesn't know the next time he's going to touch it. Uh, and, and I think that has been an intriguing storyline this season. Not only Korkmaz's ability to be an emergency ball handler, but maybe even the notion that in some ways he's better at that than as an off-ball shooter who whose value is entirely dependent on whether or not he's hot. Uh, Korkmaz uh, can provide some other things, you know, as a, as a point guard, as a guy who sets up his teammates. Uh, and we, we saw that last night, and I, I think it continues to be an interesting um, piece for this team to consider, you know, whether in some lineups he's, he's best off at point guard. But, of course, we know with him a lot of it boils down to the jump shooting, and he's probably never as good as he looks at his best and never as bad as he looks at his worst. Um, and uh, turned, in a, turned in a nice game last night and was pleased also to, to pick up his first NBA double-double. Yeah, um, excellent point there. And I think we're seeing strides defensively for Furkan too because you don't see as much as those of those lapses or when he's out there on the floor, you don't feel uh, as much as if he's uh, a liability in that regard. And I appreciate you correcting me, Dan Burke, trying to go to 3-0 and on Wednesday when they take on the Orlando Magic, um, a road game for the 76ers before coming back to Philly to take on the Spurs on Friday. Um, do you feel like – when you see Furkan have those games like he did against the Rockets, yes, they were a bit undermanned. Uh, how does he carry that into the next game, though? Because the streakiness and the consistency is probably the thing that, you know, like you said, not as bad as his worst or as good at his, as his best. But do you, do you think that consistency is something he can develop? I think overall uh, I'm still a bit – bit skeptical and as we've talked about before with bench players the standard like the average for reliability is probably a little bit lower just because it's difficult to be a bench mm -hmm. player who shoots whatever 40 percent from three-point range every single night uh i think perhaps if if you're trying to take an optimistic slant on it the ball handling angle maybe gives him a little better shot to turn in consistent contributions because at least uh, he's not hanging out off the ball and at least his value isn't so much dependent on, on, on whether he's making jump shots. But I, I think the Sixers still consider him a rising player. That they still like that he's young. They still think there's untapped potential there. But I think in terms of the way he plays, he is who he is at this point in many ways is my personal 
feeling, um, but we shall see. He surprised us a lot. Maybe he'll continue to surprise us. I think ultimately he is a streaky player. He has improved a bit defensively, but like whether he can play and make a positive impact in a postseason series, a lot of that is still going to ride on the jump shooting. I said this was kind of like a macro-micro uh, type of approach uh, with the Sixers uh, reaching 20 wins. They get their fourth straight W. They're heading to Orlando, with, which potentially could be another victory, as well as their game Friday against the Spurs. Suddenly, they have a chance to string some wins together. Uh, that let down against the Hawks, notwithstanding, they could have, you know, an even better win streak going right here. Um, you know, if we as we dig into the micro – we're faced with once again the Sixers being in a situation where they have a slow start. They play down to their competition a bit. If not for Furkan Korkmaz's hot shooting in the first quarter, they would be even in a even deeper hole heading into that second quarter. Um, are as you watch the games, is there something you can attribute the slower starts to? Is it just the uh, un you know upheaval of the lineup and guys being in and out? What what do you think is the thing that you think leads to these guys getting these slow starts and obviously something that they need to fix, but you would imagine that until they're at full strength, until Doc Rivers is back, that's not something they can fully address. Agreed. I think there's not necessarily a common thread in some of these games. Zone defense has been a problem. Last night when Houston played zone, the, the Sixers actually handled it well. I think lack of energy has has been an issue in other games. I don't mm-hmm. think that was especially bad last night. Uh, I think if you're really searching to pinpoint one thing, it's probably that the perimeter defense is a lot worse than last year because they don't have Ben Simmons, who's right. the defensive player of the year runner-up. and Which doesn't lead to those transition opportunities for those easy baskets. Indeed, yeah, it was interesting. Yeah. Dan Burke, I think in his pregame availability last night, noted that they're really trying to force more, more turnovers, but the, the last I checked, the Sixers were middle of the pack there uh, in opponents' turnover percentage, and last year they were like a top-five team. So that, of course, also corresponds to the decrease in pace, the decrease in transition possessions, et cetera. And there are just many trickle-down effects with Simmons that might not be noticeable right off the bat. I even think of someone like Tobias Harris, who I thought had a above-average defensive year last year, and there's more of his vulnerabilities, I think, that are, that are apparent when you have this small backcourt and you're trying to find good matchups for those guys. and uh, you're just sort of scrambling to make everything work and to piece it together without uh, one of the league's best defensive players. Of course, all that stuff is more glaring uh, when Matisse Thibel is unavailable, who mm-hmm. is another all-defensive team selection. But last night, uh, yeah, the defense was poor in the first half. Uh, Houston got, I believe, 16 fast break points and attempted 20 free throws uh, in the first half. Some of that was lack of discipline, fouling uh, jump shooters, and then some of it was just way too many easy routes to the rim and uh, the Sixers having to foul the Rockets to to prevent layups. Uh, so to me, uh, that was the biggest issue last night, and it's not the first time we've seen it just be obvious where um, the Sixers are, are a worse defensive team and uh, that that sometimes hurts them in, in – the beginning of these games where they start a lot slower than uh, you would expect. And, you know, okay. It it is an excuse, but you're facing a Rockets team with nothing to lose. They've got 10 wins. They're young, they're game. They're, they're ready to take on the challenge and run with the Sixers in, in any way, shape or form. So, you know, that does get factored in, in some ways, Um, you know, and also, you know, Seth Curry, you know, him reaching and causing those fouls. And he was, you know, started the game, but had to, you know, go sit on the bench with the early foul trouble. Um, He's not the same defender, like you said, a guy like Ben Simmons would be or Matisse Thibel, um, who Matisse also has been caught with his hand in a cookie jar a few times, but starting to get the benefit of the doubt and definitely a better defender who can make up for some of those 
uh, mistakes or deficiencies. Um, you know, and I, I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a Seth Curry guy, and he struggled last night. Maybe the foul trouble has something to do with that. He wasn't quite in his rhythm, but it's just exacerbated by Tobias Harris struggling and other guys not having it going on. Like I said, and being a Furcon, we're only double digit scorers for the Sixers way into the third quarter. So, yes, uh, Isaiah Joe coming off the bench and other guys contributing and definitely help with that. Um, you know, Joe giving the Sixers some wing minutes last night. But I think I want to stop down right here and then get into the Tobias Harris conversation because I'm trying to tiptoe around it. But we'll take a time out get into the Tobias Harris conversation as uh, he's struggling and him and the fans were getting into it. We got to dissect it all. We'll take a time out and come back with that. Start college, build skills, and complete your degree with Wilmington University. 100% online options and affordable tuition makes WilmU work for you. Learn more at wilmu.edu. There's so much to explore in Valley Forge in Montgomery County, Pennsylvania. Montgomery County is composed of charming towns and main streets and each with its own personality, style, and unique vibe. Whether you are looking to get away with family or enjoy a special trip with friends, leave behind the stress of planning and use our guide to find some of the most amazing things to do. Explore which town and main street suit you best. Visit MakeItMainStreet.com to plan your getaway today. Hey, uh, Noah alluded to it at the top of the podcast. You know, a little bit of drama is always sprinkled in with this 76ers team. Ben Simmons stuff notwithstanding, you know, Doc Rivers being in the protocol and, you know, the Sixers having uh, an acting head coach and Dan Burke, you know, just adds a little bit of, of flavor to everything. But the meat and potatoes of last night's drama centered around Tobias Harris. And it was another night of him struggling. Um, And we say struggling because the expectations after he had this great redemptive season last season, you know, and, you know, flirted with the 50-40-90 and was in many people's eyes a snub from the All-Star game. That carried over into this season. And yes, it has been one of those years where, the Sixers have had players in and out of the lineup. Tobias hasn't had a chance to get the rhythm and flow that Noah has alluded to on previous podcasts that benefits the type of game he plays because he has had COVID. He said it feels like he has still has a cold every day since he's had COVID, uh, which Noah alluded to in his three observations on NBCSportsPhiladelphia.com. You should check that out uh, after last night's game. But we have this moment where Tobias misses a shot. He's three for 10 at one point in the first half. The fans start to boo. Tobias takes it a bit personal and starts to egg them on to, you know, give me more, give me more type of thing. Um, And Dan Burke talked about it after the game that, you know, this is really like a blinders, laser focus type of moment and opportunity for this, this team where the, the stride that, they can make from last season to this season is to be worried about the people that are in the locker room period point blank and let that be their complete focus tobias makes a shot later in the game the fans cheer sarcastically and tobias is seen on the broadcast if you read his lips saying don't effing clap freaking or the four-letter word whatever, whatever you interpret it as but don't clap is essentially uh, the crux of, of what he said, just tell him, you know, kind of responded to the fans, like, you know, don't clap now because you were booing me earlier. He didn't speak after the game. So we don't know Tobias's thoughts on this. I'm sure we'll hear from him eventually as they have two or more games this week, but this is not the game you want to play. Noah. you don't want to get into this. And I alluded to Burke's comments after the game, that is the mentality you need to have. There needs to be, a laser focus on getting out of the rut and becoming the valuable player that he can be. And I'm sure there's some frustration with him because of the way things are going, but the potential for Tobias is, is there and he's only a point off of his average from last season, but the numbers percentage wise are not what they should be. Um, 
No, what do you you look at this as just like a moment in time or a part of a bigger issue for him and for the team? I'm somewhat inclined actually to agree with Joel Embiid when he says it's it's nothing special, in part because I just zoom out a few years and look at how this kind of thing is actually not that abnormal with the Sixers. Right. Something that comes to mind is uh, when Ben Simmons said, like, in, in good spirits and with, like somewhat of a joking tone that the Sixers were scared to lose in front of their fans. Uh, I think we've got, like, the booze, uh, as, as much as you might want to preach the idea that you should have the blinders on and you shouldn't be aware of anything around you, like, players do hear them. Uh, and you think back, like Al Horford shushed the fans in February of 2020, a, a player with a reputation as a very even-keeled professional guy. Uh, ben Simmons in 2019, after the first game of the playoffs, said, if you're going to boo, stay on that side. Uh, Joel Embiid has, has had some back and forth with the fans and tweeted out this offseason that they need to be better and then had long comments at Media Day I- expanding on – that idea saying he understands the booze and the frustration, but that not every player is essentially cut out to thrive in that environment. Uh, So I I think it's nothing new. It it will eventually blow over, but the larger story of Tobias Harris is playing basketball that is disappointing to everyone, including himself. And that that is frustrating to everyone, including himself. Uh, That is true. And, if he doesn't start playing better, that that's probably not going to go away. Uh, as we've talked about before, I think contingent on his health situation, which is worth noting, he's probably going to improve just based on his long track record. I don't believe that he's a 29% three-point shooter. I, I think he's bound to start hitting long-range jumpers at some point. Uh, but when he's not playing well, I think it's just very easy to criticize him because he's in year three of a five-year, $180 million contract. And he plays this style where the flaws are evident. And at this point, everyone knows what they are. He's too deliberate, uh, reliant on mid-range jump shooting. He's not getting those transition points as often or as easily this year without Simmons. You know, everyone is, everyone is familiar with these weaknesses and um, Tobias Harris apparently um, did did not like hearing, you know, that, that frustration from the crowd and uh, very candid too, from, from Dan Burke to give us a little insight into that locker room conversation uh, where, you know, that they spoke about this issue, but, um, yeah, overall, um, I, I don't think that a player hearing the boos and not being happy about it is actually that huge a deal, but I think Tobias Harris not playing good basketball, um, yeah, that is a big story uh, in terms of the big picture of the Sixers. Dan Burke given some great insight as well to the fact that Joel Embiid was calling plays that he thought would help Tobias get some good shots or high percentage shots or opportunities to score to kind of get him off the schneid, to kind of get him back into his rhythm. So once again, that leadership you alluded to just, you know, shining through once again. And, you know, I I try to take a, you know, a step back from this. I am born and raised in Philly. I've loved and enjoyed all these teams all my life and the culture here and the fact that the booing is harped upon, I don't really get because I feel like everyone does that. So, you know, taking a step back, maybe that's not true though. Maybe the the truth is that maybe we boo more than other cities or places that don't care as much or where it doesn't mean as much. But I think um, holding people accountable and, you know, to their value is something that Philly sports fans definitely harp on. You know, you can go to the blue collar stuff or, you know, working class, you know, attitudes and perspectives or what have you. But Philly sports fans are the money is not 
ever going to be lost on them. And the production that that money demands also won't be lost on them. Um, but if you're shooting three for 10, 29% from three, you know, haven't hit a three pointer, what, in this last couple of games, why, why are you surprised that people are booing? Like, what? Like, oh, yeah, you should support us. We are supporting you. We're showing up and caring. That That is supporting. And we care so much that we want to see you play well and to your potential. And I think Sixers fans, Philly sports fans in general, give long leashes in, in, in the fact that they're paying attention and the leash comes from the type of games that these players play and how they perform. And, you know, th there's a way to make mistakes and still it'd be acceptable. Um, in this instance with the Sixers, no Ben Simmons leaves Joel Embiid on an Island as the lone cornerstone of this team. So Sixers fans look at it like the dude needs some help. So where is that help coming from? It's coming from, Hopefully the highest paid player on your team, the highest paid contract, uh, you know, that the in, on average annual value that the Sixers have had, you know, you, you, you would expect that to come from, the, from Tobias, but you're not getting that. So I think that also precipitates some of the booing is that, well, where's the help? How come you're not, you know, stepping up when Joel needs it or the team needs it? And I think all of that and not just the shooting contributes to how the team feels about Tobias and why the booze came out. So yeah, that's a little bit Zapruderish to try to break it all down that way. But I think that it, there's a nuance there and some value that the team, that the, the fans aren't seeing Tobias give the team. Absolutely. I, I think Joel Embiid in those comments at media day about the fans nailed it when he said, Philadelphia fans care. That, that's the bottom line. And th there's just never apathy the way that there is in some other fan bases where sports just aren't as important a part of the culture and there's not as much passion about the team. So inevitably, uh, highly paid player doesn't perform up to expectations, uh, boos are going to result. One factor here that you know, doesn't excuse anything, or, but I think is worth noting is we're living in very weird times. And one aspect of that last season was until March, the Sixers weren't playing in front of any fans at all. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, many, so, so I don't know. I, I think that's, that's interesting. And I, I imagine to many, as far as Tobias's production or how fans feel about. No, just as far as perhaps him being in a spot where it's a little jarring to hear booze uh, and just, not, you know, not again, not to, not to excuse anything, not to say that back and forths and confrontations with, a fan base are the ideal, you know, state of affairs. But um, I think just it's been weird times for fans and players alike. These guys were in a bubble. Then they're playing games in their home, home arenas with no one there. Then they were there at fifty percent capacity. You know, yesterday is the the first game played where uh, you had to show proof of vaccination to get in, and there's you know there's still twenty thousand fans there, and just. Uh, it's been a whirlwind time, um, and that that comes to mind for me. And just just thinking about trying to put myself in, in you know, his shoes and trying to understand uh, him behaving in a way that wasn't consistent with with what you'd expect from him. Uh, but uh, of course, you know, fans are fans have the right, as Joel and me framed it, to say whatever they want, you know, up to the point that you're, of course, not crossing any lines with disrespecting someone's family or getting nasty in a, in a personal way. If it's just, uh, we're booing you because, uh, 
you're not performing, to me, um, that's a no-brainer in terms of is it understandable? Of course, it's of course it's understandable. Of course, it's what you'd expect if you have any idea uh, what what Philly fans are like. Yeah, um, <clears throat> I am definitely um, very pro fan because I understand that perspective. I somewhat um, understand the perspective of the player. Um, because I can see the human side, I can see, you know, the production and the work that goes into becoming the player and playing at that high level. I think that, you know, I, both sides have way more in common than they they have um, not in common. So th- there's so much, you know, common ground there. And I feel like it was a frustrating moment for Tobias frustrating for the fans as well but it, it's an easy remedy it, it's an easy fix and um easy in the sense that tobias needs to get right um and it doesn't seem to be other than the COVID stuff anything hindering him from that and i anticipate like you said that he's not what what we've seen and will perform better um Will that be when the Sixers get some help consistency wise? Will that be, you know, this month? You know, it remains to be seen, but nothing like leaving and going on the road after something like that to kind of clear your head and get yourself together. And hopefully he returns on Friday when the team plays the Spurs and is better for it. Um, Are you feeling like this, uh, you know, Orlando situation is something where you can see the Sixers continuing this momentum and picking up a victory there. Is that, is that what you anticipate? I think that's, that's not a bad bet. Um, we remember, you know, when they faced the magic earlier, the zone was problematic. So they'll have to prove that they can crack that again and uh, probably will have a lot of opportunities to shoot open threes. And if they make those, I imagine they'll be in good shape and, I imagine Joel Embiid, again, will be uh, poised to put up a a gaudy stat line. Uh, As far as Harris, I I, I certainly agree with the point that he's he's likely to improve. I just think the dynamic with the fan base is is tough in part because you can't, you know, erase the contract from history. And even if he plays at or near the level he did last season, I think there's still a large chunk of people who will feel that's not sufficient as a complimentary scorer to Joel Embiid and who will also have bitter memories of, of last year's postseason when in important games, including that game seven, he didn't play as well as many folks hoped he would have. So um, yeah, it's, it's, I think, difficult to imagine him suddenly winning a lot of folks back over, but at the same time, I'm not sure. I, I don't expect this to be, you know, incredibly sour for a long time. As you said, like start winning games, start playing better again. The booze will turn into cheers. I imagine he'll eventually accept those cheers. Um, and uh, yeah, I think that's just the bottom line of all this. Even going back to that Ben Simmons example in 2019, when he said, if you're going to boo, then stay on that side. Like by game two, he was getting a standing ovation and encouraging the fans to, to give him more noise because he, he played a great game. Uh, so that that's not to say the fans are fickle or disloyal or anything, but I think most folks want to embrace winners and, Tobias Harris like helps the Sixers win. Uh, I think some of those boos likely will turn to cheers. Uh, but yeah, as far as the Orlando Magic game, uh, I think you pencil it in for uh, for a W. But the Sixers haven't had a ton of routine games, so uh, we shall see. Sixers climbing up the standings, twenty wins on the season. Only a handful of Eastern Conference teams have reached that mark. The Sixers among them, San Antonio. Uh, awaits Friday in South Philly. Uh, vaccination cards in tow if you are coming to the arena. Um, for Noah Levick, I'm Danny Pommels. Thanks for listening to the Sixers Talk podcast. We're brought to you by Wilmington University, Wilmu Works.
We'll see you next time.